All right, let's uh, get started. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Comp 3430 Operating Systems. Today is one of those days where I wish we could have class outside. <laughs> I wish we could have class outside. It's just so nice. There's no wind. It's sunny. It's beautiful. And believe me, I've, I've thought, like, how could we logistically do this? And we just can't. Sorry. Uh, the other thing that I wanted to tell you about today that is completely irrelevant to this course, other than about the weather that you all know about, is uh, this this article that I was reading this morning, and I never thought I'd see <laughs> I never thought I'd see a picture like this, where someone's taking their electric toothbrush and holding it next to this uh, RF scanner, frequency scanner, to try and intercept communication that's going on between parts of the toothbrush. Uh, this picture. It's just kind of over the top. This picture is over the top. Like, can you imagine 10, 15 years ago holding your toothbrush up to an RF frequency scanner to see what's going on with communication? And uh, the interesting thing that this person found about, about this, this is a super tangent, super, super tangent. So this is a advertisement warning. This is not sponsored by Philips. This is a Philips Sonicare toothbrush. And uh, when you've got one of these electric toothbrushes, like you replace the heads of them every once in a while instead of buying a whole new toothbrush. And this brand and model of toothbrush, the heads have uh, little RFID chips in them. So you plug it in and then your toothbrush is able to tell you after a while, like you've used this for too much time, it's time to change the head and it buzzes at you to tell you that. There's memory inside the RFID chip that's in the head of the toothbrush, and it's password protected. And that's why he's doing this, like, like monitor the frequencies between to capture the communication that's happening between these two devices. I think he's just doing it because he's interested, but like then it's password protected, and that he, he bricked one of the heads because he was trying to brute force the password. And in this, the spec sheet for the chip that's in here, it's like you're limited to three password attempts before it locks you out. If the manufacturer has configured it that way, if they don't configure anything, it's unlimited attempts. But Philips has decided to password protect their toothbrush heads and lock it down so you can only do three tries before it uh, before it fails. And this is a really I don't know this is a really interesting article. Here's all the things that he was able to find out about like what's going on in terms of communication with the device. Uh, and then he's doing like yeah it's like exporting a wave file from this um, from this frequency scanner and then importing it. He found a tool or is using a tool that is called. Uh, GNU radio to start dealing with this and then decoding it with this thing called NSC laboratory. That's the one I was looking for, uh, trying to find out what's going on. The super tangent, that is a super tangent, but uh, that was kind of fun reading this morning. He, he was doing all, a lot of this stuff by doing frequency scanning between those devices, yeah. Between the head of the toothbrush and the body of the toothbrush, yeah. yeah. Yeah, because it's a wireless connection between the two of them. Yeah, yeah. OK, so welcome to operating systems. Uh, today, we're going to keep talking about file systems. Um, my goal today is for us to take a look at the assessment of VSFS. And then I want to introduce EXFAT. My goal for this week, just for this week, my goal to get to stuff for this week is talk about EXFAT. There is like journaling and raid after that, but it's kind of okay if that slips into next week because I really just want to make sure that you're prepared for the lab and assignment uh, starting on Monday next week or starting whenever you want to start it. Uh, that's where we're going to get to for, for this week. Um, I had some questions by email, uh, and there was one in the course forum that I'm just going to answer in class today. Um, that I want to get to before we talk about file systems. So we're gonna we're gonna do that first, and then we'll loop back to talking about BSFS and file systems. 
So by the end of today's lecture, in terms of file systems related learning outcomes, you should be able to continue to describe how a specific file system is implemented. At this point, you should reasonably be able to describe how VSFS is implemented. So the overall structure, the data structures that are related to this, how this thing all fits together. And then we're going to get into talking about EXFAT and you should be able to do this for two different file systems. We talked a little bit about this last class, describing how common file operations are performed in terms of manipulating a file system's data structures. So with VSFS, we're talking about things like uh, when we're adding and removing files, we're changing the inode table. Um, and then what we can start to think about is when we're appending to a file and making changes to a file, we're making changes to the inode data structures. We'll keep doing this in terms of EXFAT when we get to EXFAT. All right, the two questions that, uh, that I got, I'm going to put this up here and I'll come back to it after I've answered the two questions that I've got uh, in advance of class today. The first one was about random number generation. And this, it, it sort of feels like a bit of a tangent, but it's a really good question. It's a really good question and it is, uh, a good way to, to have some helpful advice about how to use random numbers. Random numbers are kind of like this black box for all of us in terms of what we've seen in courses before this. Like you get new random basically in Java when I mean, you get random numbers from that and that's it. We don't know how it works. We don't really care. We just get things that look random coming out of it. Uh, with random numbers in C, calling the rand function, it's kind of the same thing. We call rand and we get a number out of it, but we don't really know how it works. And we've been told to use this srand function. Maybe, maybe you've been told to use this srand function. So I'm going to take a small tangent to talk about random numbers. And the purpose of talking about random numbers here is to get you into a state where you can have some predictability with random numbers. So when you're using random numbers in your code, it's better for you to have a predictable sequence of random numbers than to just actually get random numbers out because you want the behavior of your code, your simulation to be approximately the same each time. So let's talk about random numbers. Random numbers, when we're working with random numbers, come from what is called a pseudo random number generator. There's a difference between truly random numbers and pseudo random numbers. Truly random numbers are from completely unpredictable sources. So generating truly random numbers, uh, there was, I think it was, uh, I think it was Netflix. I think it was Netflix. There was some company in the US in California that had this wall of lava lamps and they pointed a camera at it, and that was their source of randomness. That was truly random. There's no way to predict how a lava lamp is going to behave as it heats that wax up, and then it sinks, and it floats, and it sinks, and it floats. They just had a whole wall, and they were pointing it at it, and that was their source of randomness. I think it was more of an art installation than a real source of randomness, but it was a source of randomness. Another true random source of randomness is to have like a Geiger counter that's plugged into your machine and you're just counting, I don't know what Geiger counters count. Geigers? It's radiation, but I, I don't know what the, what the unit is that it's actually counting. Rads? Rads? Okay, counting rads. Have a Geiger counter plugged into your machine and that's a truly random source of data. You cannot predict how much radiation you're going to get in a certain amount of time um, with any guarantee. Pseudo random number generators are functions. They're mathematical functions where they have some state. You feed it a piece of state, you ask it for the next thing and it gives you the next thing. You ask it for the next thing and it gives you the next thing. And it's going to give you a sequence of numbers, a predictable sequence of numbers that appear to be random in nature. So they fall into like this kind of uniform distribution of numbers out of the thing that you're looking for. I've got this, uh, this piece of code here that I wrote that is called random.c. I can post it on the course webpage, but there's, there's not much here. You can see the whole thing right now. 
And the way that I'm generating random numbers here is that I am setting a seed. This is the initial state of the random number generator, the pseudo random number generator. And then I'm calling the rand function 10 times. The rand function takes no input. The s rand function seed the random number generator. This takes some input. And when you are looking for stuff online about how to seed a random number generator, the advice that you commonly find is to do this, seed it with time null. So let me do that. I'm going to say man three time. Uh, no, I'm going to man two time. I'm going to include time.h. And I'm going to say srand time null. Delete, 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 delete. OK. This is going to cause my random number generator to be seeded with the current time that my system has. I'm going to make that. I'm going to run it. And I get 10 random numbers. I'm going to run it again. I get 10 different random numbers. That's kind of what we're thinking about when we're thinking about random numbers. Pseudo random number generators, though, if I seed my random number generator with a constant, so I'm going to say srand, and I'm going to say seed. I've defined seed up here as just eight. That's my random number. That's my seed. That's what I want to use. I'm going to write this. I'm going to make it again, and I'm going to run it. And I get 10 random looking numbers out of it. But I'm going to run it again, and I'm going to get the exact same 10 random looking numbers out of it. My seed is the initial state of the random number generator. So there's some internal state my, that this random number generator has. If I say, here's your initial state, it will start with that initial state and then generate the same sequence of numbers. Every, every time I run it, it's going to generate the exact same sequence of numbers. When you're generating random numbers for your tasks, deciding whether they should do I.O. or not, and how long they should run to do I.O., it kind of makes sense to just pick a constant value for your seed. Pick a constant value for your seed so that the first time you ask for whether or not you should do I.O., it will always be, yeah, you should do I.O. The next time, how much time should I do I.O. for? It's always going to be this much time that you will do I.O. for with that first task. There are other, there's other factors that are not going to make it perfectly predictable every time. You're using real clock time. You're running on systems that have other people using them. You have processes that are being scheduled by a, a scheduler that's not in your control. The Linux operating system has a scheduler that's doing stuff. It's not going to be completely identical every single time, but the numbers that you generate will be completely identical every single time. So my advice to you is, uh, Pick a value for a seed. Don't use time as a seed for your random number generation. Just pick some constant value. Use your student number. Pick eight, pick four. Do something like that. Just pick a constant value and stick with that. OK. Uh, so that's that question. Um, and then the other question was asking about the multi-level feedback queue. Can we see it? in action. Can we see it? And my answer to that is sure. Let's take a look at what this looks like in action. I'm going to use the same kind of template that I had before. I'm only going to do this with two queues because I don't want to do it with four queues in class. It's just too much. Uh, you should hopefully get the sense of what I'm doing from just two queues. I've got the same number of tasks here, but I've given them all bigger units of time for how much time they have left. I've set my quantum to be five, and I'm just going to be stepping ahead in units of five for now just to, to step through the process of what's happening. The time that tasks are allowed to spend in each queue so in this case, the time they're allowed to spend in priority one before they move to priority two is 10 units of time. And then S is 30. So every 30 units of time, we're going to push everything back up into the top priority uh, queue for all of the tasks that we've got. 
I've also only got one CPU. I'm not doing this with many CPUs. I just want to keep this as a simple, simple example uh, with as few variables as possible for, for what we're taking a look at here. All right, so let's start this whole system up. The current time is time zero. Task A, the arrival time here for task A is zero. This is when our system is starting up. When a task arrives in the system, when any task arrives in the system, it's immediately put into the highest priority queue. It's always going to go to the highest priority queue. So task A would move into this priority one queue. I'm going to move this one back. Oh no, arrange, bring send backwards. There we go. Thank you. Thank you, menu. Task A goes into this priority one queue. Then we can start running our scheduling process. There's nothing else here. This is the only task that we can pick. So it immediately goes into the running state. Immediately goes into the running state. Its first runtime is zero. So I'll set that to be zero. And we'll start. There's nothing else for us to do at this point. I'm going to increase the current time to 5. The current time is 5. Task A has spent 5 units of time on the CPU, so it's got 35 units of time left. It is taken off of the processor. It has satisfied its entire quantum length, so it gets taken off of the processor. It is also spent, I'm going to add a line to this uh, queue time. It has spent five units of time in priority one right now. So I'm going to put it back into the priority one queue. It still has that same priority. There's still nothing else here, so it immediately gets to run again. There's no other choices to make. It gets to run again, so we put this back on the running task. There's nothing else to do. The next task doesn't arrive until time 15. So I'm going to skip ahead here five units of time. Now we're at time 10. Task A has finished 10 units of time overall, so it's down to 30 units of time left. Its first run time doesn't change. That's already been set. The queue time now has increased to 10. It's officially spent 10 units of time at the highest priority queue. This task is giving up its time on the processor. It has fulfilled the complete allotment. So it's going to go back into my current task queue, but now it's in priority two. Send backwards. No, I don't want to send that one backwards. I want to send this one backwards. It's now in priority two. There's still nothing else in this system. Task A is still the only thing that's in this system. And that means that it gets to go back on the processor again. I'm going to pop over here. The thing that we're looking at right now is these first two rules when we're making this decision. There's only one thing in the system. There's nothing that has a higher priority than task A right now. So rule one, there's nothing that has the same priority as, as task A right now. So rule two. So we're picking task A because there's nothing else that has a higher priority and nothing else that has the same priority as it. So task A gets to go back on the processor again. We're going to move ahead five more units of time here. The current time is now 15. Task A has 25 units of time left. The time that it is spent in Q2 now is officially five units of time. It's spent five units of time at that priority. There's nowhere else for it to go after that. So it's going to get stuck at the bottom and stay at the bottom. We run five more units of time. Task A is going to move back to priority two. But at the same time now, we've got task B entering the system. 
Task B's arrival time is at 15. Task B gets put onto the system. It is in priority one to start, highest priority as soon as it enters the system. It goes back into the highest priority. There's nothing else in our system right now. We only have task B and task A. Task B's priority is higher than task A, so task B gets to go first. Task B is going to get put onto the processor. Its first runtime is at time 15, and its queue time right now is still zero because we just put it on. It just arrived, we just immediately put it on, so its queue time doesn't change. And then after that, there's nothing for us to do. Task A is going to just wait around there. It's in this other queue, it can't do anything right now, so it just waits there. Let's move ahead five more units of time to 20. Task B has 60 units left. It spent five units of time at the top priority. And it gets taken off of the processor and it's put back into priority one. So we're kind of doing round robin with just one single process. It gets taken off and then put back on and then taken off and put back on and taken off and put back on because it's the only thing that is in that priority right now. We're at time 20. Task B gets taken off. Task C and D both arrive at time 20. They are entering the system, and they start in the highest priority queue. I'm going to move this down just a little bit so we can see the color of the queue that they're in. Task C and D are both arriving at time 20. And they're both put into the high priority queue. They're just starting in the system. They have the highest priority. Task A is still just sitting around in priority two. It's not going to do anything because it's just kind of stuck in that state right now. You could arbitrarily have put task C and D before B, or you could put B first. Kind of doesn't matter here because they're all at the same priority level right now. So task B then gets run. We'll start here. Uh, we'll start here and put task B on the processor. We'll move these two over to the front of the queue. And now we're kind of in the state of rule two. We've got three tasks where they all have the same priority. So we're going to run them in round robin now. They're all going to get to take a turn on the CPU. So task B starts running. We're going to increase time uh, to 25. It has now spent 10 units of time at this queue level. It's got 55 units of time left. I'm not going to run this to completion, by the way. Just, just going to get through a few of them to see what's happening. That will take a long time, and I don't want to go through everything. Uh, but we've got 55 units of time left. Task B is going to be taken off. We're at the end of the quantum. We're at the end of the time slice. And it has spent the full amount of time in that queue. It's going to be inserted into the next priority level. It's going to be moved down to the next priority level. And it's going to be inserted there after task A. If this is a queue, we're going to insert it at the end of the queue. The amount of time that it has spent at that queue, that it spent running at that queue, is now at zero. It just got inserted into that queue. At this point, we're going to ask which one gets to go next. Task C would get to go next. Its first runtime is going to be at time 25. The time that it's spent at queue level priority one is, is zero. So it hasn't really done anything yet. I'm going to move task D over so we know that it's the next thing to run in our system. And then that's all we do at this time instant. We're going to move five more units of time ahead. And now we've got a lot of stuff to do. 
So at time 30, I'm going to start by taking the running task off. The time that's left for task C is 35 units. Whoops. The time that's left for task C is 35 units of time. It spent five units of time in the queue right now at the top priority. We're going to pop this one off. We're going to put it behind D. We're going to reinsert it back at the end here. Task E arrives in the system. So we're going to move task E into the current task queue at the end. It's just started in the system. It gets to the top priority level immediately. The time is the value of S right now. And that means that everybody moves up to the top priority level. So we push those two tasks down to the next priority level. But now we're at time S, or some multiple of time S. So we have to move everybody up to the top priority. So what I'm going to do is task A and task B are going to be put into the highest priority level here. And I'm just going to obscure this lower priority level a little bit, move backward. So now everybody has the highest priority level. And we're all queued up here waiting to go. And we're going to start to go through some kind of round robin approach. So start with task D, then C, then E, then A, then B. And we're going to keep going until we get up to a certain amount of queue allotment for each task. And we'll push them down. We'll slowly push them down. One thing I didn't do here is uh, the whole idea of what happens when we're doing I.O., what happens when we yield a task. So I'm going to start by doing that. So I'm going to do one task like that. At this point, we've put everybody into the top priority level. Everybody's up at the top priority level. And I'm going to schedule task D. It is the next thing that's in my queue that's at the top priority level for me to schedule. It has a first run time of 30. It has spent no time running on a CPU at this priority level. It hasn't spent any time running on the CPU at this priority level yet. So zero. And I'm going to start uh, by scheduling this task. And now I'm going to behave like what I'm asking you to do with uh, I.O. stuff. So I'm going to first make a decision about whether or not this task is going to do I.O. And I'm going to do that. by rolling a d20. And I'm going to say that uh, this has an odds of IO of 50. I got 2. So it doesn't do IO. I'm going to say it doesn't do IO. So I'm going to skip ahead by 5 units of time. That means I don't have to say how long it runs before it does IO, because it doesn't do IO. It just takes the whole quantum. This is going to now be 45 units of time left. The time that it's spent running at this queue is 5, and everybody shifts over just a little bit. We're doing a queue here, and we de take this thing off and put it at the back. Task C gets to run. Task C was in priority 1 when we started here. I'm going to try to make this decision. Does it do I.O.? I'm going to say that it's going to do I.O. 90% of the time, just to, to get something going here. What is it? OK, so it does I.O. Can you roll it back to me, please? <laughs> what is it? What is it? It's eight. OK, so we're going to say that this does. Um, so this is D20. So this is going to do like, let's say, 40% of a quantum. And I'm going to round down here. So this task is going to run for 
two units of time, two units of time. It's going to run for two units of time. It does I.O., it's going to run for two units of time. That means that I'm going to skip ahead to time 37 here. We will do, there's 33 units of time left in this task. We only did two before we yielded the processor. The, the time that it's spent at this queue is just two more. So it's now at seven for this priority level. And it is yielding the processor. So even though we're not at a multiple of five here for quantum, this task is giving up control of the processor. It's going to get put at the back of this queue of stuff that is at priority level one right now. Once we're here, this is a design decision you can make. This is a design decision you can make. Do you wait for the quantum to elapse? No, you shouldn't do that. Do you wait for the quantum to elapse? That would be a reasonable design decision to make where you just don't do anything, like nothing gets scheduled. But that doesn't really make a lot of sense. A better choice would be to let's schedule something. Let's notify from the CPU that there's nothing running on me right now. I need another task. The scheduler says, here's another task. We'll pop task E on. Task E gets to run at time 37. First run time is at 37. It's queue time. It hasn't spent any time running on this processor now. So it's a time zero. Everything else is still stuck in priority one. I would, I would decide if we're doing I.O., but I don't know where my dice is right now. Say it's 50-50 odds greater than 10. It doesn't do I.O. I'm going to say that I rolled a natural 20, and it's going to do I.O. Forget this randomness noise. It does I.O. And it does uh, 1 20th, so it'll do one, one unit of time before it does I.O. So it's going to spend one unit of time working and then doing I.O. So I'm going to say we're now at time 38. It's got 24 units of time left. It's spent one unit of time at this priority level running on the CPU. I'm going to take this task off. It's yielding the processor, and it gets stuck at the end of this queue of tasks. Then we do task A. And at this point, at this point, I'm going to stop because we would just keep proceeding with this approach. How much time does it get to spend on the processor at this queue level? Push it down if it spent too much time, if it goes past the queue allotment, and then move everybody up to the top level when we hit that S value. Yeah, so my, my suggestion here is as soon as somebody is off the CPU, whether it's because they did I.O., they finished, or they are at the quantum length, somebody else should start immediately or as soon as possible. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. Uh, so I'm going to rephrase your question, just not along if I'm saying the right thing. If you've got multiple queues, when you do the priority boost, everybody gets put up to the top. Where do we put priority two? Where do we put priority three? Where do we put priority four in terms of order of where they get inserted into the queue? When I did this, I used one queue. I just used a priority queue that's prioritized on pri priority. That's prioritized on priority. And I just went through and I set everybody to one. So whatever order they happened to be in, in that queue, they stayed in that order. It, that would turn into, uh, if you've got four separate actual physical queues, that would mean taking priority two first and putting it on the end, then priority three and putting it on the end, and then priority four and putting it on the end. Yeah. Yeah. 
Your arrival time, um, your arrival time for simplicity should be just like get the time. Just ask what time it is. Not not even like relative to when the delay is, but just ask the CPU, ask the OS, what time is it right now? No, so when you when you're reading in the tasks, that's the arrival time. So when they're first inserted, their first runtime is whatever the time happens to be, whatever the clock time happens to be when they get put on the CPU for the first time. Yeah, completion time is whatever the time happens to be when they're done. Yeah, so the, that first batch, again, let me know if I'm misinterpreting what you're saying, but the, the question is, what's the arrival time for the first batch of tasks? Because they all arrive before the scheduler starts. Uh, the arrival time can, can, honestly, it can be whatever the time is as you insert them into the queues because we're, we're talking about really tiny fractions of a second difference between their arrival times. Or you can say, get the time just before you start inserting them and set them all to be the same time. Yeah. The, the actual difference when you get to the point of measuring across 100 tasks is kind of irrelevant. Yeah. 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 So what I would do for this is uh, probably just have the scheduler busy wait, like not even use condition variables at this point. Just set a flag. Once you've read that first set of tasks, set your flag to run scheduler. This doesn't even need to be condition variables. This can just be a simple flag because one's just testing the value, the other one's going to set it. That first batch of tasks would arrive at time zero. Oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Then and then you start running the scheduler. But again, kind of related to this, even if you start the scheduler immediately, we're talking about a, a really irrelevant amount of time difference between the two. Well, in this case, I only had one task that started at time zero. So that's kind of like I have one task and then a delay line. Yeah. Yeah, I don't really care that much. No. I'm really much more interested in your ability to implement this policy and use condition variables and stuff as opposed to the like tiny differences between when tasks start. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But you wouldn't necessarily need to use condition variables to like make any comments? You need to use condition variables in general, yes. But to tell the scheduler to start scheduling, you can just use a simple flag. To notify CPUs that tasks are available, you should use condition variables. Because you just want whichever CPU is available to pick it up. And you don't know which one's available right now. Unless you have like a ton of extra stuff for keeping track of which CPU is not running right now. Just use condition variables. The, the flag I'm talking about here is just to get the scheduler started. There's tasks, start. At that point, it never stops scheduling tasks. This is kind of a one-time thing where there are tasks available constantly throughout the execution of the program otherwise. Yeah. Only so the question was um, if the task or the CPU is sleeping and I send a broadcast, does only the one that's only the ones that are actually waiting wake up? And the answer is yes, only the ones that are actually waiting will wake up. The ones that are sleeping are not waiting on a condition, they are sleeping. Yeah. 
When you, when you do I.O., it's going to give up the CPU, so some other task is then able to run on the CPU. And then when we did, like, when we run the test and test is available, we running, and then if we have another batch, another CPU, we also written the other test that is running. Right? Yeah. So that's not also an I.O., right? When, when I'm talking about I.O. with tasks, I'm talking about just the idea of them yielding the processor. So they're not actually going to do I.O. And when, when you're talking about reading the file, the tasks file, that, that actually is I.O., but that's a kind of a separate idea from the simulation of the policy. But that I.O. that we read the text from the file, we, we actually the, think that it's going to run using the CPU. I'm I'm not a hundred percent sure what you're asking. Because when you say that we are just doing the simulation of the IO and when we using the random number, yeah. we don't use the CPU. But we want if we read the text from the file, we, even though it's an IO, but we actually use more than that to do that. So the 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 thread that you're going to have that's reading the tasks from the file is its own thing. It doesn't really belong in the simulation of tasks. It's not actually running any of the tasks. It's just creating an instance of a struct, for example, and then inserting it into the queue. And then it just goes back to reading the file or sleeping or whatever it's doing. But the, the IO, and I'm quoting this here, the IO that the tasks are doing is how long do they run sleep on the CPU before they give up the CPU? So they're going to try to, they're going to be giving up the CPU before their quantum has finished. That's what we're trying to simulate here. So those are two separate ideas. OK, OK, OK. Kate, did you have a question? No, OK. You were sort of putting your hand up, and I wasn't sure. OK, OK, OK. All right, yeah, yeah. So that's, <clears throat> that's kind of a design decision on your part. They should send a notice that says, I've taken the task. So it's OK for you to put another task to be available for someone else to take. But they don't necessarily need to send a signal to say, I've finished the task, because they're just going to reinsert it into the, into the queue. They should then check to see, is there work for me to do before I wait on this condition variable again? But they don't need to signal to say, I'm, I'm ready for more work. Or alternatively, if you want to structure it that way, you don't schedule anything until somebody signals you to say, I need more work. That, that's a completely valid option. Yes, yeah. All right, OK, I'm going to switch back now. And. Uh, I want to spend time talking about VSFS again. And what I want us to do with VSFS is just quickly remind ourselves of the overall structure of what's going on here. And then I want us to start being able to answer some questions about VSFS as a, excuse me, as a file system. So VSFS is really remarkably similar to ext2 in terms of the structure that it has. It's close enough that we're going to call them the same thing interchangeably. They are not actually the same thing, but we'll call them the same thing interchangeably. In terms of VSFS, we've got this kind of structure here where we've got this unit of stuff that's called a block. Our drives have sectors on them, and a block consists of usually more than one sector. When we're thinking about file systems, we're always thinking about something that's higher level than sectors in terms of the basic unit. And in VSFS, that basic unit is a block. At Sector zero at block zero with our file system, we've got the super block that has metadata about the file system, including things like what the block size is. After that, we've got these two allocation structures, two bitmaps that are being used to say whether or not 
a block is being used or an inode is being used. And this is that sequence of ones and zeros where one is saying this is used, this is not used. After that, we've got the inode table, and there may be several blocks of inode tables. The inodes themselves are the structures that we've got that correspond to files and directories. One inode maps exactly to one file. After the inode table, we've got the data region. One inode can map to many data blocks, many, many data blocks, but it is going to map to at least one data block. I'm going to scroll up here, down, it's down. I'm going to scroll down. An inode here has metadata about a file, so it's got things like permissions or modes. It has a user ID that matches to which user created it in the first place. It tells us how many bytes the file has. The file size may not be the same as the number of blocks that are being used. So we have multiples of 4K blocks here, and our file size is bigger than one block, but not as big as two blocks. So what we've got in this case is something like this, where we've got an unused section. This part of block two has been allocated, but is not used by anybody. In this inode structure, we've got block pointers. These are direct block pointers that refer to numbers, uh, the number, the block number that we've got, data in. And then we have this other idea of indirect block pointers, where an indirect block pointer points at a block that itself is filled with direct block pointers that give us the ability to address more than just 32K of data in a single inode. What I want us to do right now is, uh, is spend a little bit of time answering some questions about this file system. So I'm going to pass these out. Take a copy if you want. This is also up on the course webpage as a Word document, so you can edit the file if you want. And the way that I want to do this is I'm going to put up a slide that has some information that we're going to use to answer these questions. And what I'm going to ask you to do is spend a little bit of time with these questions. So I'm going to give you a few minutes to look at them. And then we're going to step through them one at a time about how to answer them. I'm going to pop up a slide here. So both this diagram and this set of questions are on the course webpage. So you can have either of these open at the same time. I'm going to give you some information about this file system that we're going to be evaluating. And these are the values that you're going to need to use to be able to answer these questions. Block size is something that's configurable when we create the file system in the first place. So when we've got this partition or volume and we create the file system on it, the program that creates the file system gives us the ability to change these settings. I can choose what the block size is supposed to be for this file system. For us evaluating this file system, I'm going to say that the block size is 4 kilobytes. In our inode structure, we have 16 direct block pointers. We have one indirect block pointer and one doubly indirect block pointer. I've given you two sizes here. So how many bytes a single block pointer has? It's four bytes. How big an inode is? It's 256 bytes. And we have exactly one inode table. So it's one block, one block for the inode table. So take three minutes, start looking at these questions, and start thinking about which properties here we need to use to be able to answer each question. For now, what that means is, if you're writing on this paper, what I'm looking for you to answer minimally is, which properties are being used? So which of these values is being used to answer the question that's on this page? Take three minutes. I'm going to put that on my timer. And then we'll start working through this together. Can you repeat that, please? 
Yeah. The unused space here. So is it possible to use it again? The answer to that is, is no. Once it's allocated for an inode or for a file, it's allocated to that inode and file. We can't use it for anything else. Yeah, good question, thank you. Okay, so I, 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 I'm not expecting you to like answer all these questions. Just to be clear, I'm just looking for you to familiarize yourself with the questions. I'm, I'm, not ask, I'm not expecting you to answer the questions in three minutes. Let me rephrase that. I'm not expecting you to answer all the questions in three minutes. Just take a look at them, get a sense of what's in them. I got the questions here, and I'm going to put these side by side. And we're going to have to also kind of switch between this and the diagram that we've got to be able to start thinking about the answers to these questions. So our first questions, our first set of questions is about file sizes. It's about how much space can be addressed by a file system and what's the maximum number of files. So how can we, uh, take a look at the extremes and limits of the file system. Our first question here, what's the largest file that this file system can store? This question is kind of indirectly asking how many blocks can an inode point at? So in our structure, we've got this idea of direct block pointers. It's an array. It has block numbers in it. And each one of these blocks that we have in this array is going to be the data that we have for the file. Our indirect block pointers 
is pointing at a block that is filled with direct block pointers. Each of these direct block pointers are also pointing at blocks. So block 8, 10, and 30 are being used by this file. Doubly indirect We'll say that this is at block number 60, somewhere far ahead, so that we're not looking at some number that we've used already. This is pointing at a block that's filled with indirect block pointers. 70, 80, 90, dot, dot, dot. Each of these are pointing at blocks that are filled with direct block pointers. So kind of like what we have up here. I'm going to draw a dotted line here to say it's the same idea as what we've got here. So what this ultimately looks like is that we have this inode structure that can point at some number of direct blocks. We've got an indirect block pointer. Our indirect block pointer, the number of blocks that that indirect block pointer can point at indirectly is going to be the block size divided by the block pointer size. That's the number of blocks that we can point at with that indirect block. And our doubly indirect pointer is Kind of the same idea. It's the number of blocks that we can point at. So it's going to be one block that we're pointing at that's filled with indirect block pointers. So it's this block size divided by block pointer size. Squared for each block pointer that we've got in our doubly indirect block, we can point at that many more block pointers. The number of blocks that we can point at is the sum of those. It's the sum of those times the block size. That's how many inodes on inode can point at. So our first question, what's the biggest size? What's the biggest size file that a file system can store? If we just put one file in the root directory all by itself, the biggest thing that it can point at is how many blocks can I point at using all of my direct, indirect, and doubly indirect pointers. Is that OK? So it has one doubly indirect block pointer. So our doubly indirect block pointer, it's pointing at a block, right? That block is filled with indirect block pointers. So when we follow those, those are blocks that have direct block pointers in them. In the inode struct, so when, I, when I'm saying that, I kind of mean if we've got struct inode, uh, 
I'm writing here and it's completely obscured by the window. Struct inode, we have direct pointers. And I think, what did I write there? I think I wrote eight, 16, there's 16. So this is going to be block star direct and there's eight of them. And then we're gonna have block star indirect but it's just a single value. So we're not gonna have any more than that. And then likewise, block star double indirect, DBL indirect, like that. Yeah, okay, good, good. So this question, what's the biggest size of file that this file system can support? Of course, this is an extreme, right? This is gonna be some like giant multi-terabyte file or multi-gigabyte file. When we're thinking about workloads, this becomes important if most of the files that we're trying to store are like close to the limit of what this file system can handle. This is maybe not the right setting or not the right file system to use for what we're looking at. If everything that we want to be able to store in this file system can comfortably fit within that maximum file size, then this is probably the right file system or at least a right file system to choose for what we're looking at. Uh, I'm going to skip to the next question. So what's the maximum size of a volume? I'm going to skip past that one for now. And I want to go to what's the maximum number of files that this file system can store. I'm going to pop this back up here. The maximum number of files that a file system can store is pretty much the same as the number of inodes that we have in the file system. One file, one inode. It doesn't matter how small the file is. If it's one single byte and it doesn't use the whole block, we can still, we still have to use an inode to represent that. So in this case, what's the max number of files that this thing can have is how many inodes can we have? We've got a single block of inodes. Our block size is 4K. The size of an inode is 256 bytes. So the number of inodes here is going to be 4K divided by 256. This is not precise because we have an inode for the root directory. We have to start somewhere. So we lose one inode for that. But if we take all of our files and we just stuff them into that single root directory, that's the maximum number of files that we could have. The next set of questions, I'm going to go to the next set of questions here. The next set of questions here are about how much space is wasted by the file system. When I say wasted here, I want to make sure that I'm putting this in quotes. I want to make sure I'm putting this in quotes. The file system must have metadata. It, it's not going to be able to store your files if there's no metadata about your files. It has to have some structure. There's got to be something there. So when I say wasted, I mean what information or how much space is used by the file system itself to represent what you need to have. In this case, how much space is, is used by the file system on metadata? There's a couple of questions that we're looking at here. One is how much is used by the file system's metadata overall? And that answer is thinking about, I'm gonna go back to my diagram at the top here. That's us starting to think about how much is used by things like allocation structures. How much is used by something like the super block? How much is used by stuff like the inode table? So how much is not in the data section of our uh, file system in the data region? The other part of this question is going to be how much is used by things like directories? In this file system, 
inodes represent files, but the actual files in a directory are stored in the data region themselves. So an inode represents a folder. So let me say it this way. We've got an inode that represents something like our root directory. So let's go down here. We've got an inode table here. This is my inode table. Inode table. And what we're going to say is inode number zero, inode number zero corresponds to the root directory. On a Mac, on a Mac or on a Linux system, the root directory is forward slash. It's kind of it's the, the the root. It's like the root of the tree. It's the root of the tree. It's the top level thing, the top level directory that we have in our system. On something like Windows, this would be like your C drive. This is the top folder that you have stuff in. The root directory itself has an inode. It's a folder, it has to have an inode. And the root directory has block pointers. And I'm gonna say that in this root directory, dot, 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 we're going to have a block at, say, data block two. In our data blocks, we've got blocks every four kilobytes in this file system. This is going to be block number zero, one, two, three, data region, data blocks. The block pointer for the root directory here is going to be pointing at data block two. What data block two is going to have in it is going to look something like this. So I'm going to pop open my terminal here for a second. And I'm going to say ls slash. And in slash, in my root directory, I've got a bunch of folders, and I've got things that are files. These things that are lighter colored blue, those are uh, links to folders. They're things that look like files, that behave like files. They're like shortcuts. In this directory structure, in the root directory here, I'm going to have entries that look like this. There's going to be an entry that says, here is the name of a folder, and this is inode number seven. Name inode. I'm going to have the name of a folder, boot, and this is inode number 12. And I'm going to have the name of a file here, so I'll say sbin. And it's going to be at inode number 15. My directory structure is not my data, but it is in the data block section. I have to have this relationship between file name or folder name and inode number in the data block section. This is some of the metadata that's lost, or some of the space that is lost to us by metadata in the file system keeping track of the folder structure of names and stuff. So if we take, uh, if we take inode 7, we kind of do the same thing here. If we go back to our inode table, we'd find inode number 7, and we'd do the same kind of mapping. The data blocks that it refers to are going to have folder structures inside of them, and we'll be able to take a look at the folder structure that way. OK. Is that okay so far? We're okay with that? Good. Okay, good. Good, good, good. 
how much space is wasted by very small files? That question is kind of what you're asking. If we go up to my picture of Walter here, if I use a data block, if I have a data block that has been assigned to an inode, so I've got this file, walter.bmp, that has two blocks that have been assigned to it. A block is either fully assigned to an inode or it is not assigned to anything. It is either used or it is unused. I cannot take what's left of this block and use it for some other file. The extra space there is lost to us. So when you do things uh, in your terminal, or when you're looking at file sizes, sometimes you'll see that a file is reported to be slightly bigger than it actually is because it's taking up a full block of the file system. It's not going to give you uh, the amount of space that you've got for just that file. Or if you look at the disk usage overall, it may be more than you're expecting because there's extra space that's lost for these files that are taking up half of a block. Not very much, like we're talking about bytes here, but we're losing space here for files that are very small, that don't quite fit into a block. Taking that to an extreme, if I allocate a file that has one single byte of space, it uses the entire block. We cannot use that space for anything else. That block has been assigned to an inode, so we can't use it for anything else. How much space is wasted by very big files? The opposite question here is, how much space are we losing to direct, uh, sorry, indirect and doubly indirect block pointers for those files? How many blocks are we losing just for the metadata that the file system is using? All right, I'm gonna leave this here for now. And uh, what I want to do is start thinking about EXFAT. I want to switch file systems. In the last couple of minutes of class, what I want to do is uh, move back to my slides here and give you a really brief introduction to what we're going to be looking at with EXFAT. And then tomorrow, we're going to spend time visualizing this whole thing. EXFAT is a Microsoft specification. This is something that Microsoft created as an extension of FAT going all the way back to the 70s. I, I believe that Bill Gates was actually the original author of FAT. Like he wrote this for DOS or something of however much of DOS he wrote. I, I don't really know, but I believe it goes all the way back to him. This file system specification was published like fairly recently by Microsoft. This was published, I think, in the last five years. It's a fairly recent thing for them to like give, give people information. It's fairly rare for them to do that. They're changing, they're good. I used to be like, no, Microsoft bad. And now I'm kind of like, nah, Microsoft is still bad. They did give us this though. The FAT file system, there is a white paper for that. There's this PDF that you can download that describes FAT32. And I really do not like that white paper. I feel like the author of that white paper was like making terrible assumptions about who was reading it and then talking down to them. I really did not like that white paper. This is a very good document. I think that this is a great document. This is a really, really good document that comprehensively describes EXFAT. If you had nothing else, like no other information about EXFAT, you could do it with just this document. If you know about functions like LC can read and open. The one thing that this document really truly lacks, and I'm gonna scroll down here, it's a big document. Don't get me wrong, this is a really big document. What you're going to notice about this is that there's lots of tables, there's lots of text, there's lots of subsections, there are some code, there is no diagrams. There are zero diagrams in this document. I will diagram this for you. I will give you the diagram of what EXFAT looks like. 
this actually is irrelevant. Don't worry about this table. This is not something you're going to need to do anything about. I will draw this diagram for you. I will show you the structure of what the file system looks like. I will show you generally how you get data out of the file system in terms of the general structure of uh, the file system. And we will talk about that all tomorrow. In terms of comparison to uh, VSFS, the biggest, biggest difference between VSFS and EXFAT is that EXFAT is a list-based file system where VSFS is more of a tree-based file system. We're generating trees to represent files as starting at the inode. With EXFAT, we're building up lists of things. So we'll take a look at that tomorrow. Uh, I hope that you otherwise have a good day, and I will see you tomorrow. Bye, everybody.